Hey, welcome back to another episode of the Ruby Rogues podcast. This week on our panel, we have Valentino Stoll. Hey, now. I'm Charles Maxwood from Top End Devs. We have a special guest this week, and that is Sviat. Um, do you want to just tell us who you are? And Sure, sure. So um, I'm a backend engineer at Evil Machines, and I really love working with all the exciting technologies using Ruby Next, like to make Ruby look like Golang, for example, uh, writing parsers, uh, running RubyWasm in browser with runruby.dev. And Charles, you decided to bring me here to talk about API documentation, right? That, yeah, that's my favorite topic. I'm, I'm every week on the show. I'm like, we're not talking about API documentation. Why am I here? Let, let's fix it. Yeah, let's let's do it. So I, ha I have to say, it seems like documentation is the thing that everybody just kicks the can down the road with, right? Um, I'm also going to point out, uh, so not this contract that I'm on, but the contract before, um, I was working on some uh, AP. No, it was two contracts. Ago. Anyway, um, I was working on basically integrations between two APIs, right? It's like, hey, get the information out of here and sync it up with the information over here. And uh, I have to say, uh, API documentation is a con concept that uh, some of these folks could have worked on. <laughs> Let me just put it that way. The people who documented the APIs, it's like, it's like, okay, yeah, you're telling me all these fields, but you know, it doesn't actually tell me how to use it right, and so I wind up trial and erroring my way through sending them a date or a string or, um, you know, the structure of the data I have to send back. So yeah. So how do we do it better? Yeah, so uh, I I was uh, in the same position, and I was one that did that to you, not not to you, but you know, to different developers uh, with the poor documentation. So uh, if you, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> partially. So uh, uh, yeah, let let me just tell you a tiny story that covers up like the whole of my career, like like past ten years, uh -huh. and doing API. Um, APS. So I started my Ruby career in a small uh, healthcare startup, and we had a simple Rails uh, API only uh, application on the back end and uh -huh. two native mobile apps. So only three of us, no seniors, no rules, no documentation, and everything went pretty fine uh, until we started developing fairly complex features. And quite soon, we understood that developing uh, features spread across three different platforms without any API documentation is quite painful. So we started documenting our API using uh, a new and hip app called Postman. So mm -hmm. you might use that. And Post that saved my life <laughs> on <laughs> the, the scenario I was talking about. Because I could True. rapidly go, this no this no this no this no hey it worked oh it kind of worked this <laughs> anyway yep yep uh, basically that's what we did so you can save those uh actual uh like tries and uh reuse them later so yep. that was our documentation at the moment at the moment and it went again pretty fine until we forgot to update it too many times so and our postman collection became constantly stale and uh, with that, we discovered Rswag. And Rswag is a gem that extends uh, Rspec with a special DSL and uses that to generate an open API documents, uh, which then turns into a beautiful live documentation. Um, and that's basically my dream came true because you know um, we generated something like Postman collection right from our RSpec tests. Mm -hmm. That's a miracle. And we don't need to think about API docs. They are just there and always up to date. That's cool. So the resulting uh, development process, uh, it looked like this. So I developed a v0 version of a new API feature that we need. I tested that with RSwag, generated documentation, and passed that to mobile devs. Then they use the documentation and they implement their own 
like interfaces. And sometimes they, they ask me to fix my A API. And since it's Rails, I do that pretty like quickly, right? Mm -hmm. The need to rewrite tests when I do those changes was kind of irritating, but still it, it worked pretty fine. Until the time we decided to um, add a medication reminders feature to our app. Um, to support that, I designed a model that added two fields, like start date and end date. And uh, I made end date knowable since for, for cases when reminders should never stop because, you know, medications. Mm -hmm. So um, with, with that, um, Weeks later, I'm testing the resulting application, the mobile application. And what I'm seeing is a reminder with the end date in the year to, uh, like 4001, which is kind of strange to see that. Uh, That's and coming up fast. Yeah, apparently iOS developer decided to mark those infinite reminders with a date distant feature, uh, like distant future. Uh -huh. uh, and that thing, uh, serializes to the year 4001. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Since mobile devs in my team, they were better team players than me, they discussed that decision, actually. And Android developer did the same. But in Java, serialized version become the year 1999. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so... Um, that was a sign that something went com completely wrong with our workflow, right? And uh -huh. the problem is we had the documentation in place and the end date was marked as nullable in that documentation. So, and if you think about that, it's really logical to use like null for, for end date that is unknown at the moment because it can be anything that user mm -hmm. can add like date there and stop. Uh, taking those medications like tomorrow or in two weeks or in two years, right. whatever. So the null is like, it's like by the book, like it's like the description of null. And yet mobile devs decided to do that horrible wrong thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, but if you think about that, actually it was me who was wrong because my attitude towards the documentation was completely wrong. I thought about that as a like artifact, and I didn't write a you know, like proper description to explain why the end date is nullable. And we never discussed that edge case with the team, or maybe we did, but we lost that somewhere in the Slack thread. So, mm -hmm. RSVEC didn't help me to become a better developer. <laughs> um, thankfully, about the same time, I bumped into a talk about documentation first approach from. Uh, RailsConf 2018 by Ariel Kaplan. And after that, I, I finally realized that documentation is actually the core of my API and not just a leftover. So now I, I honestly, I, I, I can't imagine developing APIs in the other way. So let's, let's dig into this. Like, what do you mean by yeah. documentation first? Like, I know, uh, you know, folks can, Listen to Ariel's talk, uh, you know, after this, because uh, it is pretty great. Uh, but can you sum up just like, what do you mean by documentation first? Sure. So with documentation first, uh, you start your work by writing the specification for the resulting API. Uh, and that might sound like uh, the most boring thing in the world. But actually, that's what the best programmers do when they design their code. Um, Mats doesn't start with the implementation of a new feature for the language. He discusses the interface first. And in that discussion, uh, that, that discussion itself, it, it might take much more time and effort than the implementation itself. And probably that's why we love Ruby. And maybe that's why we have next to none breaking changes in our language. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, like another example, like imagine silently preparing a giant PR to bring something cool to your project or say to open source project. Uh, and let's say you prepare the PR for 
Rails active model, like bringing something really cool and giant and awesome. And you opened it and you got a review from someone from the core team. And they say that actually, you know, the resulting interface, it's not in line with the Rails standards. Like we have all those different uh, ideas already here and there. And they have like all the examples and clear action points for you. Uh, so it's not a rude no, it's an <laughs> actionable thing. But in result, to get your PR accepted, you need to rework everything from the scratch. And I don't know, do you feel the pain right now? Mm. Because I definitely do. <laughs> what would be better uh, to create an issue and discuss the interface first, right? That's basically the documentation first approach. So let, let's give uh, another example with an API, since we are talking about APIs. So you are working on a new feature. You design the models like services, commands, form objects, whatever you use. And you tested all of that, of course, uh, and you pass the result to your team. And apparently your like pagination, filtering design, whatever, it went out of sync with what front end needs. And for some reason, they are locked to use that specific, you know, format because of framework or vendor, whatever. So it's your fault and you must to drop everything. And all that beautiful, well-tested, perfectly designed, reusable code that you did, you just need to remove that and start from the scratch. So maybe, like, I don't know how many listen listeners uh, screaming in agony right now that that would never happen to them. <laughs> um, like, but if there is no process, you might discuss pagination, but forget about filtering uh, or miss the fact that front end needs that specific interface and so on. Uh, we are all just humans or machines and we need processes to guide us, right? Another another idea is a, no one ever complained about my dogs, so they are good, probably. Um, Charles, you, you had your, your story about documentation. Have you ever told the other side that their dogs are bad? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So uh, in, in my situation, I worked in a company with 100 microservices and like four or five different server-side languages. Uh, in that structure, you're always a consumer and the provider of an API, right? So I saw what happening uh, when someone uses those auto-generated docs uh, with like this idea that it's a simple artifact. And it was just unusable, as you said. Like It was just a list of function names uh, instead of human readable uh, descriptions. And uh, it was just a silent list of hopefully all attributes. And that's not enough to work on. Uh, yeah. In cases, yeah. I just want to chime in there. I mean, this is the problem I have with like our doc as well and things like that is like you've got some comment or maybe it'll actually scan the code. It's just, yeah, you you don't get the whole story, right? It's like, okay. I've got a list of parameters and maybe an endpoint to hit or something, but it doesn't give me enough to know how it's meant to be used. True, true. So in case when uh, it was Python or JavaScript on the other side, I was able to just open the code and read it instead of documentation and it was fine. Uh, but when it was Java or something else, I just started DMing developers because it's impossible to uh, work with. Um, so, Valentina, I, I know you use RSpec. How how you use that? So, do you document your your API? Do you use that, you know, DSL extensively? Some teams use it more than others, um, but yeah, it's used in a you know RSpec focused realm uh, where the specs will basically you know. There's another side of this where documentation first is a nice API first, uh, you know, design principle. Uh, another realm of people also think test driven is also a good way of also documenting the code and processes. 
uh, which may be not the best case for all API design. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's definitely more test focused than it is uh, documentation for me. Cool, cool, cool. So actually, you, I, I, I met people who um, do RSwec, do use RSwec extensively. Like they, you, you can write beautiful documentation with RSwec, but there is other side. Like, do you, um, like, can you ask your front end team to write those RSwec tests for you? Or maybe in that case, when you work in a company with a lot of backend stacks, are you ready for some parcel tongue developer to write your tests for you? I'm sorry, but I'm not. <laughs> yeah. So let's use YAML instead. So yeah, the document documentation first, um, or you can call it specification first, schema first, uh, design first, whatever. Uh, it's all about that. It's all about bringing the process to your workflow. Uh, it will not work if you just silently write a giant YAML first and then write the implementation all by yourself. There is no communication. So uh, it might be still better because it will work like TDD. You think about uh, interface first and then implement it. But still, it's all about communication. And your documentation, it's, it, it must be the central tool of communication with your teammates, with your clients. And for external API consumers, your documentation is your product. When you're, you develop a feature and forgot to document it, you just wasted your, wasted your time, right? Uh, no one ever find it in that closed code, even in open source like 1% of users will open your code and read it actually and try to find the feature that will never mention, uh, like what was never mentioned. That's cruel, but you know that's true. So uh, with that, I hope I sell the whole idea of the documentation first approach. Like we write documentation first <laughs> and um, we can move forward towards you know technical details next. Yeah, the technical details is kind of what I wanted to dive into. But um, I mean, people have done TDD. Yeah, you you get that thought process ahead of time. You know what you're putting together. And yeah, I really like the way that you put it where, yeah, your API is your product. Because for a lot of consumers, it will be. True. So let's get into the technical details then. Sure. So how do you do it? Is this like readme driven <laughs> development? You've been mentioning our swag a bunch too. Sure. So um our swag is um code first, not code first, test first, I guess, but not the documentation first for me at least. You can do that uh documentation first, but it's still much harder to um write our spec uh than right than it's right to, to write. YAML files because you can use editors like and everything. And again, YAML is understandable by other teams as well. So even your I know like manager can read the YAML, I guess, especially in, in the editor like Swagger um, editor, uh, because they can read the documentation, like the resulting documentation uh, from the start. So, so hold yeah. hold on. So you're saying to write, so you can write it in an R swag format, I, and this is just coming from me not having used it, or you can write it in YAML. So yeah, <laughs> Let, let's circle back a, a bit. So um, in the documentation first, uh, the whole idea is that you have this uh, standard, you have this uh, you know document that describes your API, mm -hmm. and in our realm, like with uh, restful -ish APIs, that standard is open API. And right. by the way, Ruby Rogues has an episode about open API with Josh Bonnelot. And I think we will leave a link to that episode in show notes. So uh, Josh also wrote a book about open API. Uh, and to me, that book actually looked like 400 pages of design first he called that design first workshop. So if you want to really dig dive uh, into that, 
topic and see how it works like um, in, in 400 pages. You, you can um, check his book out uh, because he does a great job giving a very detailed description of the whole workflow. Um, but yeah, so we have this standard open API, which is um, a standard for describing RESTful APIs and the resulting document is a uh, YAML or JSON file. It contains descriptions for all your requests, responses. It lists like HTTP methods, paths, query params, headers, body attributes, whatever. All that you need, right? So um, that's our center of attention, that, that file. Mm -hmm. And next, you can, um, the, the way you will generate it, the, the way you will get it file, uh, that's a different like approaches you can work on. Uh, for example, uh, you can use RSwag, which uses uh, metadata from your uh, request tests and also adds a special DSL to uh, for, for descriptions and all that stuff. So in the result, when you run your uh, tests, it also generates the file, that open API file for you. Or you can obviously just write it manually. And there are plenty of editors. And yeah, you can do that as well. So this is something you can write ahead of time, right? It's not something that just because because you were saying you you effectively you know write your stuff ahead of time instead of like I said I'm I'm kind of imagining something like RDoc where it you know it looks at your code and reads the comments but even if it inspected the code in this case you can just write R spec tests or uh, things like that in order to say this is how the API should perform. And then it generates the documentation from the DSL. Is that is that what we're looking at yep. here? Yep, yep, yep. With but it's RSpec, the DSL for your happens. tests, and not from your and not from your code or whatever. So if you haven't implemented yet, fine. True. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, there is also a way to generate open API uh, from your code. So there are helpers for like controllers and all mm -hmm. that. So there are different approaches. The problem with those approaches, like when you, for example, use code like um, DSL in your controllers, obviously you need to write the whole thing. That's a problem. When you uh, you can move that to tests, now you need to write your tests, which, which is also sometimes problematic. You still need to uh, bring all those models and all that. Um, so even less hard to maintain <laughs> approach mm -hmm. for me at least is writing the whole specification first okay that's yaml yes that's that's that might be a problem but at like at the same time you can read it javascript developer can read it everyone can read it so i don't i didn't i don't know if javascript developers speak yaml i think they speak json that's also the same format so <laughs> <laughs> i know Right. So, so what's your whole process then? So you sit down, you write out the specification. Um, yeah. You port that into a test with our swag, or do you even do that? So yeah, uh, if you uh, go my way, uh, which is writing the YAML first, uh, then you just open a PR, for example, and discuss that uh, documentation with your team, uh, with your mm -hmm. like stakeholders, whatever and they all can see what is happening you you can bring like you can uh, get like um uh, really fast uh answers and uh, gain the information that you missed uh while doing that so uh, that's the first step and then you can get the resulting uh file and start developing your part and front-end developers can start developing their part. So it's also like um, you can work at the same time, uh, which is a great feature. Um, regarding oh, the... Uh, Just hmm? real quick, uh, while you're developing the spec, uh, are you saying that that is 
like made available for people to kind of play with, like in a, a UI kind of way? Um, sure, you, you can generate, like if you set up a PR, um, like CI to watch your PR and to develop, like deploy uh, documentation, why not? So it depends on your workflow. So yeah, so, so just, yeah, just to kind of dive into this a little bit. So you generate the YAML. So does it generate the spec for you, the specs, like the R spec specs for you? Or do you still have to write those separately? So yeah, um, in, in my case, uh, I wrote a gem that called Skuma. Uh, and that gem adds like three or four uh, helper methods to R spec or mini tests uh, to your request tests. So um, to test your request against the, the specification, uh, all, all uh, you need is to prepare the request, call it, and then uh, write something like um, assert the specification, or, or uh, it depends on, on the uh, framework, but like um, it is ex expected to conform schema the code of response that you are looking for. That's it. Like one line. With that one line, you are get like you uh, will test all the headers that you write in your documentation, uh, in your specification, uh, all the attributes, body attributes, like request, response, all that with just one line. So that's that's a great way to clean up your tests, I guess. Yeah, that sounds awesome. So then. So then you just go and implement, right? So then you're writing your your API through your controllers, or I sure, saw in yeah. your article you were using Grape API, which I may ask you about in a minute. But yeah, so <laughs> that's just way, an example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I I love Grape API and I hate Grape API. So um, anyway, uh, it's yeah. So so that that's pretty much it. So you're you're you've got your documentation then in YAML and you've got your tests that run and things like that. So um, I guess the other thing that I'm, I'm wondering about here, because there are some benefits to OpenAPI, right? Yeah, I, yeah. I'm pretty sure you can, you know, if you have OpenAPI compliant documentation, then you can import it into Postman and things like that. Um, and if you haven't tried Postman, you should. It's It's a terrific tool. But I guess my question is, um, what about written documentation? Because to a certain degree, yeah, just having it pull up and say, you know, yeah, you're going to send this kind of a request, you're going to get this kind of a response, you're going to see this kind of behavior, you know, on the other end. But sometimes you need a little bit more than that. So how how far does this get you as far as, like you said, the API being the product, how far does this get you as far as somebody like me coming along and going, okay, how do I talk to this app? and being able to get the information I need out of it without necessarily being able to read the YAML file or being able to see it. Sure. So uh, OpenAPI uh, allows you to extend itself like with special X um, keywords. So all of those uh, generators, like documentation gen generators, uh, they come with those uh, special keywords that you can use to generate like a special uh, pages and okay. use a markdown to uh, explain everything you want. So um, there is also idea that you can tag use tags to your uh, requests and also add a description to your tag. So for example, you come to users tag, it's a, like a big chunk of your uh, document documentation and you can put markdown there and just mm -hmm. kind of explain everything about users you want. So yeah, that's all available there. So I'm curious what your approach is for like, you know, sample data. You know, how, uh, that's definitely one of the like hardest problems I find with even docu documenting specs, <laughs> right? Like is how do you fake the data in a way that is also like, accurate to the usage right uh like you can't just like sample production data all the time <laughs> and so like what what is your approach for that and then maybe how does like the opening having it as a separate specification how to how, how does that help 
uh, you know, in that process. Right. So um, to me personally, I was um, interested in that at some point, but then uh, it wasn't needed uh, on other uh, like projects. So I'm not currently, you know, up to date here, but there are different ways. Uh, for example, there is an issue in Skuma uh, to allow such um, like interface for uh, adding examples from the test data, like providing that um, and adding that to the uh, specification. Uh, I hopefully will uh, <laughs> come to, to that issue uh, someday. Um, so uh, another thing is that um, like what's the issue that you want to fix? If you want to fix the problem that your um, example data might be out of sync with the uh, rules that you um, described, there are like plenty of uh, tools to uh, validate that because uh, open API, it's a common standard. There are like di different languages and different tools. Uh, you are not scoped to Ruby only tools. So there is like a lot of tools for almost every idea and thing to, to do. Um, so yeah, um, I, I, I don't remember the name for, for that tool, but it's definitely there. Yeah, I mean, just as an example, I think of your, you know, original use case where you had the end date that was like to infinity, you know, like, how do you like, how do you even model that from a fake data perspective? <laughs> uh, you know, how did you, in this case, like document or uh, maybe not even document, but specify that uh, in the specification? So the specification allows you to use, it depends on the version. Like if, if it's version uh, 3.0, you, you can uh, say that it's nullable, true. And if it's like more uh, common, uh, like the current version 3.1, you can use uh, like array of types, I guess. That's something uh, that you can do. And yeah, that's, by the way, that's painful because uh, if you will write null uh, now without like, uh, not not as a string, um, that will be null the data, <laughs> not the string, which is painful, but anyway. Um, so yeah, uh, and in that case, I don't think you can do anything but just using your plain, like, English to to to, to just describe what is happening because that's what documentation does. Probably you you can't read documentation that contains only examples, right? That, that's a strange documentation like Rails guides, and there is just a list of you know you know there is a site with like something in 15 minutes or something like that, like different mm -hmm. languages and all that. That's just one big chunk of example. Um, yeah, that's, that's, you can use that, but. <laughs> so when you're designing APIs, right? So let's say you, you, you're like, all right, you know, I need an API for my application and I'm putting it together and, um, you put it out for feedback from your coworkers or, you know, maybe customers or whoever, right? Um, what kind of feedback are you generally looking for and how do you prompt them to give that to you? Because I swear, like half the time when I ask for any kind of feedback, like in a PR or something, it's just like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yep, that's good, right? And so, and, and, and I want real feedback, right? It's like, no, we, we don't do it that way or, this would make this easier on me when I'm building some other thing, right? Yeah. So <laughs> I don't know, like th that uh, feedback, it sounds like the feedback from people who are not interested in um, the result, you know? Uh, and I don't mean like in rude way. I mean like, yeah, that, that will be fine. I, do, I don't really care because you will make it work, right? I, right. I do uh, understand that you will do that. But in API, uh, that's an interface that will be used by those people. So they kind of, they want that to be easy for them. So maybe right. they already have thought about some uh, edge cases in the UI or something like that. Again, the pagination is, is a great example because 
for example, they want to use like infinite scrolling and they can use uh, like cursor pagination or they want to use like pages and you did the cursor pagination and it's obviously not that something that they can use. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm this makes me think. Uh, so I, I'm in GraphQL a lot. That's what all of our clients use. And I, it sorry, makes me think like, of a, oh, I, I love it. <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> um, but it makes it does make me think like, you know, a lot of times you'll have the front end people separate from the back end and you'll have the same stories kind of working in parallel, right? Like where somebody will be working on the interface and somebody will be working on the back end stories. Uh, and you'll race kind of like, <laughs> you know, to make sure that the, you know, front end team can align with the back end, but also like that you're supporting everything that they need. Uh, and a lot of times people will just like make, you know, fake wrappers of what they w might expect to need, you know, in order to build whatever that they're building, you know, what is, what is your, like, where does that, uh, you know, specification aspect fit uh, in that kind of workflow where, you know, people need to use it right away and the specification gets molded kind of as it's getting worked on. Yeah. Um, so um, the great thing about um, Open API is that you have mock servers, for example, so they can use them and uh, you don't need to touch a keyboard for that. So they will have their mock data and you don't need to uh, like uh, do that uh, yourself in, in the backend code. Um, another thing is um, that it's fine to uh, get back to the specification. Uh, it will happen in, like with all humans, as I said. So yeah, but the uh, probability, I think, is much, uh, you know, less. It, it's much less common to to uh, go back and fix something if you already thought about that uh, in the first place. So uh, Valentino brought up GraphQL, and I have not talked to anybody about OpenAPI for a long time, and I haven't really looked at Swagger or OpenAPI for a while. Does this work on systems like GraphQL, or is it only like REST systems? Um, so right now, it's only REST systems, and it's... It's even hard to implement, like describe uh, something like RPC because that's just one endpoint. And um, just what open API looks like, that doesn't work with, with such cases. Mm. Um, there is a new version, like the version 4.0, uh, Moonwalk, I guess it's it's it called. Uh, so in that version, uh, they do my like, they try to support uh, such cases when you have one endpoint and a lot of different uh, like actions. Uh, so I don't think that GraphQL uh, is like interesting for, for them <laughs> uh, because right. it already has a schema and all that. But yeah, those cases with um, when, when you use just one uh, endpoint and a lot of stuff happening there, uh, because of like I don't know like different headers or query params, um, that's what what they try to uh, fix in the new version. So one other thing that I think would be good to cover for folks is we've used the terms Open API and Swagger interchangeably. Do you want to explain what they are? I don't know uh, about you, but I didn't <laughs> because that's uh, different things uh, actually. Uh, okay, swag I may have used them interchangeably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Swagger is a company that developed the um, first draft, like the first, I guess, couple versions of Open API, the thing, and called that Swagger uh, at the time. And they um, decided to, uh, like, they were occurred by another company, I guess. I don't, like, something bare. Sorry, I don't remember the name, but anyway, uh, it doesn't matter. So they um, just uh, decided to make it open source, the whole specification, and uh -huh. then they renamed it to Open API and made it public. Uh, I mean, like open source, 
and Swagger, uh, that name they uh, decided to keep and name uh, their tools uh, with that name. So when you talk about Swagger right now, you probably refer to their tool in like Swagger UI, Swagger Editor, and so on. OK. So all of this uh, you know, API automation and schema documentation just makes me think of function calling uh, in the AI realm. Uh, are you are you using this uh, kind of methodology to like for code generation purposes or for like uh, augmenting you know AI workflows and stuff like that? So uh, as I said, I, I prefer to uh, write open API docs uh, manually. So yeah, in that case, something like uh, Copilot it, it helps a lot to write them. Mm -hmm. uh, so but. Regarding code generation, uh, actually, there are generators uh, in the open API realm. It's not about AI, but anyway, since we are talking about that, uh, you can generate uh, client-side SDKs, which will include validation, serialization, all the good stuff. You don't need to write that. And like there are different languages and versions. There is even version for Ruby. Um, and they even have SDK generators for server code, so you can generate your server. Um, I I don't know of any Ruby gems for that, like Ruby generators for that. But still, if you if you want to generate uh, JavaScript something, yeah, you can do that. So yeah, I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> I, I was just looking at your uh, Schema JSON uh, stuff, where it, it validates the schema. Uh, and that's very much kind of like what function calling does uh, when you're working with something like OpenAI, uh, right? Uh, so I'm just right. curious if like you were you were using it maybe for that purpose uh, in in the Ruby side. No, no, I may me. I may try it out. <laughs> I'll let you know how it goes. So JSON Schema is another gem that uh, like uh, implements another standard that is used under the Open API. So when you describe uh, different um, things in, in open API, it might be like query parameters, body, whatever, uh, you use, you actually use a uh, JSON schema, um, in version 3.0, it was like subset superset of JSON schema, which was painful for everyone. So, uh, with version 3.1, which is the current version of open API, they, uh, First of all, they upgraded the version like for five major releases of JSON schema, which is um, that's a different story. Um, but yeah, they they also made it like the standard, so um, you can use that. And yeah, that's that's a great tool actually for validation. Yeah, it's funny you can uh, you can pass schemas uh, to you know these large language models and. It, it knows how to adhere to it even without like the function calling aspect, which is kind of interesting. Um, yeah, so I'm curious, like uh, now that you have like this documentation first like approach, like how do people like it on your team? Like, is it is it like everybody's excited about it, or is it like kind of a, <laughs> is it a struggle to get people on? Are people still hesitant? Like, how is it working out? It depends. It depends. So, for example, Vladimir Dementiev of the Balkan, he, he hates it, I guess. I, I don't know, like writing something manually without DSL, he just, ah. But, you know, the, the approach, it's good for small teams uh, if there are different uh, stacks. But if you work in a full stack team or something like that, that's overkill basically if you don't need to discuss those apis or for example uh inertia js uh you you can use that to just eliminate um the whole uh api thing from from your application because um i don't know if you know about inertia uh but um it's a javascript library plus uh it, it has plugins for uh for example, Rails and for different front end um, frameworks like React, Vue, Swell. I love it. <laughs> yeah. So um, 
when you uh, use that in your application, uh, you just replace your view files with uh, whatever framework you decided to uh, work on. So for example, with React, and there is no API for that. So it, it just like passing the whole um, bucket of data um, just renders that. So yeah, you, you can remove the whole API thing from your application and yeah, no, no need for uh, manual YAML writing. Yeah, I think it, it even works kind of like in an SPA uh, style of uh, app too, which is interesting. So is there anything else that we should know about with open API and Swagger and all that stuff? Yeah, I don't know. Like if you use open API to document things, um, whatever you use, like RSwag or uh, Skuma or whatever, uh, please dig deep into the tooling stuff that they have, because it doesn't matter if you generate your documentation with RSpec, for example, uh, you still can use all those tools to, for example, lint your API documentation. And with mm -hmm. Open API, your uh, API, it becomes, I don't know, you can touch it, right? It's a whole new uh, experience because that's, that's something real. And since it's a real, you can lint it. You can uh, use static analyzers on that. And you can, for example, uh, you can use tools to uh, catch um, like some errors or, uh, for example, OWSP problems with mm -hmm. like security, all that. So yeah, that, that's really powerful idea. And please, please, Play with that. You can use linters. You can force everyone to add descriptions to to RSwag using those tools because you can use um, linter and add that to CI. And yeah, that will blow up unless someone uh, did their work properly. Nice. It, it sounds like what you're saying. There's there's no excuse for poor API documentation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, but I like my excuses. They make me comfortable with being lazy do you do you create uh api documentation for like side projects and just one-off things that you're trying out uh that's such a painful question actually because <laughs> <laughs> all, all my side projects they are more like gems and at logical thing to do like why not document your gems first right like right <laughs> no <laughs> no, my gems has next to zero documentation. That's so painful. You ask that. that that's so rude <laughs> of sorry. you. Like we, we almost we, we we're almost done we're with so the close. podcast, and you, yeah, <laughs> we never would have known. I, to be to be honest, like I I I'm curious about this question, right? Because like uh, you know, why don't you? Why don't we like have this creativity and ex like experimentation like with a documentation first? thing like wh what is like the barrier from us like thinking about our ideas in a specification way uh versus like where we're trying you know like mm. i don't know i it's a it's a question i think about a lot uh that's that all about like the the talk that i told about uh, mm -hmm. from ariel kaplan it's all about that that you are um you can write that documentation up front because you have to like you are so energetic at that moment. You are like <laughs> right. creating That's stuff, fair. and it's it's easy. You you want to like understand it m yourself, and you think uh, I will I will uh, do that way or that way, and I need to fix those such cases. And wow. you know, at that moment, that's just <laughs> when you can do that. After like after you did the all work, it's just like describing. Uh, all that and and it's, it's the worst part well it's funny because not just documentation but in other areas right i mean i still see people that and and i've gotten out of the habit of writing tests right or writing good tests um or you know some of the other code hygiene things that i do on the front end um that i know i should do right and so it, it really just comes down to I mean, not even whether or not you believe it or believe it to be a good thing or worth your time. 
it's a matter of discipline and and it seems like a lot of this stuff just comes down to discipline right are you committed to writing the best code you can are you committed to delivering the highest quality product you can right i mean obviously as you approach perfect it takes more and more effort to get it you know to get more quality out of it but you know are you committed to putting out stuff that just you know ticks all the boxes on stuff that is maintainable right because we're not talking about oh you know i'm going to write this documentation so that i can pat myself on the back i'm writing this documentation because i know that it'll make somebody else's life easier right i know that it'll make it easier to maintain i know that it'll do these things for me and so it, it really is down to discipline and whether or not you're willing to do the sometimes tricky stuff in order to make it work but the thing that i found too is that the more i do those kinds of things the better off i am because uh, my skill level goes up right i can more easily tackle more difficult problems because i've done the discipline then to write to make sure that my documentation is up to date or to make sure that my tests run and pass and that i have decent uh test coverage or you know that i am breaking up my huge models or giant controllers or whatever other thing right that i know i should do um i'm doing it because it makes a difference later later on down the road so anyway i'll get off my soapbox but I, the the discipline questions one thing that i like to hit is you know what you're supposed to do are you doing it the processes the, the processes can help you also like linters yep. Yeah, just just turn on the uh, linter that uh, like what it was like the linter that uh, tells you to write uh, five lines of code at max for for a oh for a right. <laughs> well, I don't always agree with those, but the thing is, is that you can like with RuboCop, you can make it whatever you want it to be, right? So you can tell it no, I'm okay with ten line methods. Right, or you can just turn the rule off if that's something, or maybe it just check it, check for egregious stuff. If it's fifty lines, then I have a problem. Right, I don't know. But but yeah, getting into it, it's like okay, and that's the other thing is is I think people get into the mindset of my documentation has to be perfect the first time, or right, or you know the the linting rules. The linting rules have to be exactly what I want. Sometimes you have to fuss with it a little bit in order to figure out, and it's not even to get what you want, it's to figure out what you want so that you can have it, right? And so it's, you know, five lines of code in a method is way too restrictive, right? I just, I find myself frequently needing eight, right? So I'm going to bump it to 10, right? Totally fine. Go to 10, right? Not hurting anybody. But, uh, you know, a lot of times those are the other excuses that we use to not do the stuff that we know we ought to have in place. The cool stuff about like all those linter rules that you can yeah turn on of them, but that's an opt-in action. You need to think about that. Why can I do that? It's like strong migrations jam that allows you to ignore all those rules. Like you're trying to uh, like break um uh, you know, add a new index, for example, to the table, and it yells at you like, "Hey, guy, that that will be like painful if there is too much data." But you know right. that it's like a ten lines of uh, like ten rows, so you can do that. So it's all yep. about that, you know, thinking. Hook. Yep. I don't want to think. <laughs> no, <laughs> I think I, I, I'm I'm curious, like how. Uh, how all of this will pan out in the long run. Uh, and I, it makes me think of like, you know, things like, uh, you know, Copilot or something like that, where, you know, you're just documenting things and then it just fills stuff out. Uh, and I, it'll it'll be interesting to see how those kinds of developers evolve over time. Uh, and, and hopefully like, you know, <laughs> the auto documentation test aspects of it just like happen. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but I don't think we're there any, anywhere near term. Um, but I do think about like, uh, you know, Gary Bernhardt's like original destroy all software stuff. And mm -hmm. when I was getting into tests, you know, for the first time and just seeing that like workflow, like he's just wild. Like 
oh yeah, let me open up a test so I can make sure that this thing works right. And like before he does anything, like no code right. written, right? Like, and it's like, okay, I want it. I describe, basically it's documentation, right? I describe how I want this thing to work and then I go make sure that it works, right? Uh, and that's definitely a very like, it's a shift in how like you're kind of taught like coding wise where it's like, all right, just go try to do something, right? And I think that's maybe why we have a hard time in our side projects, like documenting things is like, we just want to go try it, right? And we just mm -hmm. want to like mess around with stuff. Uh, and maybe we need to like veer away from that, like thinking and learn how to mess around with things in a more controlled way. Uh, yeah, there was an, another um, wild idea. Like, uh, I, I think it's from Ben when, when he was in, in uh, Sotbots. Uh, so it was idea that he will just remove uh, all non-committed code like once a for a while. When so when uh, he work on something, he uh, gains more information. He knows mm -hmm. what he wants to do. And if it's not committed, then it's okay. He will just write it uh, again, and it will be better. Something like that. So yeah, not another extreme idea. I, I, I <laughs> yeah, I know. One from was me. it Toby Luke from Shopify? He's notorious for doing that for just like nuking his entire you know <laughs> stuff that hasn't made it and just rewriting it again. Mm -hmm. And there was I forget what. Yeah, there was a, a there was a Kent Beck was doing stuff that. like Kent that Beck, too. Yeah, yeah. I forget what they uh, called yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, I think it was red, green. And then there was something else. And it was basically you throw the code away and do it throw again. Throw the code away. <laughs> and I can't remember what he called it, but yeah. I mean, I don't know how many times I've like gone and, and done code and then had just like it disappear because I committed the wrong thing or like missed something or a rebase, right? And then they're like, whoops, I don't know where that went. And then I just like rewrote it and it was good. So it can be good, but it's frustrating. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get into the picks. Oh, it's it's uh, it's TCR. It's test and commit and then revert or test and then commit or revert. And so if it's not good enough to commit, then you revert and do it again. Anyway, um, let's do picks. Let's let's uh, start wrapping up. Uh, Valentino, what are your picks? So as my recurring trend seems to be, uh, I have a lot of AI picks here. Uh, one is called Udio. .io, udio.com, sorry. Uh, it's basically a uh, really awesome uh, AI music generator uh, where mm. you just give it a prompt and it generates like incredible songs. It's just wild. But it also lets you like focus on either, either just like the instrumental aspect or you can break it out. And I've been messing around with it. It's so much fun. Um, my uh, other pick is. Uh, I came across, I, I've been playing with Alama a lot lately, which if you're not familiar, just lets you try out a bunch of different large language models that are, are open source and available. Uh, and I came across uh, this uh, project called Lit GPT, which basically is Alama, but with uh, the ability to pre-train and fine tune and adds a bunch of those uh, aspects of large language model development on top of it. Uh, and so I've been messing around with this. It's a lot of fun, and uh, it makes it super easy to get started with all that stuff. So I recommend checking that out. Very cool. Um, I'm trying to pull together some stuff. Maybe I shouldn't announce it before I have it ready. Um, I'm trying to pull together some stuff to put together um, an AI and Ruby summit and just bring in people who are working on all this stuff because it seems like there's a lot and it's very, very interesting. So anyway, I don't have dates or anything or even know who the speakers are, but um, yeah, looking at that. Um, my picks, I usually start out with a board game and I'm just, I'm not thinking of a board game I really want to pick. So I'm, I'm going to pass on that. Um, I am going to pick if, you haven't read it yet folks um ayush who's one of our other co-hosts uh he wrote the rails and hotwire codex and i decided you know because sometimes i how do i put it i guess uh in the past the way that i've learned things is just by kind of i need this i need it to do it and so i'm gonna go find the way that it gets done 
<clears throat> and he kind of walks you through the process of, of doing the things that you're, you know, that you're looking at there. And so um, I'm about a quarter of the way through the book at this point. And so far, he's walked you through building your own authentication. He's walked you through um, setting up uh, Turbo Native for Android and iOS. He's walked you through um, a bunch of other stuff, you know, some fundamentals on stimulus and stuff. And yes, yeah, so a lot of it I knew, but um, some of it I wasn't as familiar with. And it's been really, really fascinating to work through it. And at the same time, you know, kind of get a better handle on some of the things where I had kind of muddled my way through and now go, oh, OK, Th this is this is how this works. And so this is the way that I ought to be doing it. And sometimes I disagree with his approach, but it's been really fascinating to get through it. So I'm going to pick the Rails and Hotwire Codex. It's about $100. It's an ebook that he put together. Um, and then I got back into The Walking Dead. So several years ago, I watched the first, I don't know, five seasons. And uh, then I quit watching it. And they've put out like 11 seasons and they have like five spinoffs. And I was like, I really liked that show. So I've been rewatching it. So I, I'm going to pick The Walking Dead. Um, and yeah, I guess the other piece is, is I've been kind of doing a rewrite of Top End Devs. Um, basically with a lot of the stuff I've been picking up out of the Rails and Hotwire Codex. And I have to say, I am very, very happy with Tailwind and Tailwind UI. So I'm going to pick those two. Um, all right, uh, Zviat, what are your picks? So, yeah, sure. Um, I I really struggle uh, maintaining focus while reading books. So my first pick will be Speechify, uh, which mm -hmm. is an AI-based uh, text-to-speech application. And that helps me read more. Um, it highlights text uh supports like um importing ebooks and all that so uh that's basically my go-to app for reading right now uh another peak uh will be uh kagi search i hope i i uh, pronounce that right it's a paid search engine uh, which is by itself already interesting and unusual <laughs> so th their idea is that um they are um, privacy first. And there is also a feature that I want to highlight, uh, which is they have integration with different AI models like ChatGPT or Google's Gemini and all of that for 25 bucks a month versus 20 bucks uh, in ChatGPT, for example. So um, they don't offer all the features from ChatGPT, uh, like you can't use Dali, for example, for images, uh, but still, that's a great um, thing to use. I also love that I don't need to go uh, from uh, the search engine because that's my go-to site, <laughs> basically. So yeah, and twenty bucks plus five bucks uh, for a search engine. Why not? All right. Well, if people want to follow up and uh, find you on the internet and ask you questions or you know, give you feedback on what we talked about on, on your verbal API. Uh, <laughs> sure. Wh wh so, where do they find you? Yeah, you can find me in twi uh, on Twitter or X, uh, whatever you work, uh, you use. Uh, so it's skrukov uh, underscore dev. And I'm skrukov on um, GitHub. All right. Well, we'll have all that in the show notes. Thanks for coming. This was awesome. Cool. Thanks for having me. It, it just it makes me want to go play with open API and the swagger tools and see what I can do with it now. So <laughs>